All right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to What's Your Story. I'm very excited. have a friend of mine on all the way up from Canada today. Um, connected with him on social media, I think, a couple of years ago, honestly, just because so much in common from competing in bodybuilding. We both became WMBF pros. Uh, so just someone I've connected really quickly with on social, started following his stuff, and he's continued to inspire me, motivate me with all the content he's putting out. Um, if you're in the bodybuilding world, especially drug-free bodybuilding, he's someone you need to follow and check out. Um, again, like I said, WNBF pro bodybuilder, physique coach, and he's also the host of the Natty Muscle Radio. Really cool podcast, talks about natural bodybuilding, so definitely give that a look. But just at this point, man, I just want to welcome Connor to the show. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I do remember we connected in social media a few years ago, and I remember um, I remember quite well when you won your pro card. I think it was a show... Um, it was a show in was it a show in Boston, if I remember right? And I remember you were in great condition. And I do also remember there was some tough guys at that show that you uh that you kind of beat with your condition. So I was, you know, I immediately latched onto that and was like, I'm following this guy. This guy is what I want to do. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. It's I, I you're right though. It was one of those shows. So I did uh two shows, one down at Cape Cod Classic. That was my first one. Um, first one competing in bodybuilding. So it was one of those I did a men's physique like seven years ago. And then hated it, did horrible with it. So it took a while to get back on stage. Did a Cape Cod, came runner up in overall, and then um, the uh, Boston Battle in Boston. So I did that one, ended up winning the overall there. And then it was like three uh, three classes, 27 guys. So it was a, it was a pretty good class. And uh, yeah, I was definitely not the biggest guy by any means. So I came in, I think, at like 163, 164, like 5'9". And the guy I beat, I think, had like 8 to 10 pounds on me, but just came in soft. You know, crazy physique just soft. I remember the pictures. It was uh, really, it was, um, it was uh, a, a black gentleman with really like round muscle bellies, like really oh, yeah. full, really impressive. Like looked like very much like an old school classic physique type, 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 uh, type build. I guess you could say. And I was like, I really took a notice of that because I was like, wow, like his condition beat out like the crazy muscle bellies and the crazy muscle mass. So I was like, hmm, I'm gonna file that in my head for the next time I prep. Well, that's what I think I've learned, man. It's interesting because, like, if you're in, you know, if you're using gear, if you're in the, you know, NPC and stuff like that, they're going to take a bigger guy usually. But, you know, OCB, WMBF, like, it's, they take conditioning. You're like, you'll get, you know, Brian Whitaker? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So you look at him and them. I mean, he's crazy shape in general. But, like, when he's beating, like, the, the Siobhan Cunninghams and all these big boys, it's, uh, his conditioning just takes it. So, yeah, I learned that pretty quickly after the first one. I was like, shit, I don't have to be the biggest. I just got to out condition, even if I'm, I'm not built for it. I have long arms, long legs, but it worked out. Um, but to transition though, like to you. So like when, when did you get into like weight training in general? How old were you kind of like, why did you get into it? That process? So my story is I started when I was about, I think 18 years old and, um, I had just finished playing football, um, kind of, kind of in hot, like we it actually wasn't correlated with high school. It was like an under 19 football league, I believe. Um, but I had just played my last year and I was definitely not a good football player at all. But what I did find I enjoyed was the small amount of preparation I would put in before a season with like weight training. And I wasn't, I wasn't really consistent with it at the time. I was much more focused on being a musician. So I and I did end up going to university to study music and jazz studies specifically. So my major focus at the time was uh, music, to be honest. But, you know, after football ended, I really wanted to stay active and I didn't I didn't see myself playing another sport. And I started to get very interested in weight training. And I thought this I can make this my thing. You know what I mean? And I remember at that time, I started to get online, like a lot of people did. There was a very popular website at the time called T Nation, stands for Testosterone Nation. Um, kind of fell off popularity the last few years with social media, but at the time, that was the place to go for information. So I kind of find myself getting captivated with the ideas and articles on that website. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. We're almost full circle. I started, you know, in this little basement gym that I'm now back in, but that's what I started to do, doing pull-ups and bench presses and then Eventually, when I was 18, I think I joined my first uh, gym, which was the university gym here. And uh, it was actually to rehab an injury from football. Um, so that's kind of what what got me in it. And then all this all this stuff started to happen. And I just I just kind of fell fell in love with it, I guess. And, you know, I really enjoyed listening to the music that I would like and just going in there and just having an hour to myself just to just to really feel good and to get out some energy because I wasn't doing any sports or anything. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I get started into, 
into lifting, I guess. Cool. So with that being said, were you the type of kid growing up who were more introverted to yourself? Um, and that's kind of like what led you to, to like into it too, or like more of like the, a confidence thing, or you just got intrigued by it instantly, just maybe from like getting stronger, the results side of it. Um, I wouldn't say I was especially introverted. I kind of ran with a, a bunch of different crowds. Like mostly I was a musician, so I would kind of hang out with a bunch of like the metalhead kids in the school and I was in the metal band and that's was my favorite thing. But then I would also play football and I'd talk to the like the other guys like that. So I was I was fairly like well rounded socially and I didn't really have like um I always had a decent self image of myself and I never and I think this is kind of how I lasted so long competing because I think a lot of people they do have problems with that and this can build them up but it can also be a 50 50 thing where they they might see their best shape and then they dwindle a little bit and then that makes them feel bad about themselves again so I always had a fair amount of self-confidence and when I kind of got in the gym I found that you know I kind of I wouldn't say I built muscle crazily fast but I found like the results did come to me um in a on a decent time frame uh and that kind of just was a lot of positive reinforcement to keep doing it and I, I still like I didn't I, I think at the time I didn't I, even though I wanted to, you know, make improvements and make gains. I still just really like going in there, listening to my heavy music and getting out some aggression and just feeling good after I left. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people can relate to that, too, especially when you brought up the, the side of it of, you know, I think a lot of people get into it because they're a little insecure. That's how I got into it. And like you said, as you get these really good results, you feel good about yourself. And then like an injury or you can't get to the gym and it just messes with you so much to like the point where psychologically you're just off. So it's, it's tough for a lot of people that, to have that. It's cool, though, that it, it never really affected you that way. Like, you know, you said an injury, you lose a little muscle and you're just mind fucked. Like you're just a mess. Um, yeah. And I, I think um, uh, just to comment on that, I, it's really interesting because I think the main thing that I was kind of building my purpose off of at that time was my music. And what made me feel good about myself was my ability to play guitar. And this kind of just started to be a hobby. Now things have kind of shifted where I've gotten away from the music and bodybuilding is my kind of principal focus. And it probably would, you know, really hurt if I had an injury and saw myself dwindle because I kind of my self uh, perception of myself has, has changed with how I equate my values to like how how good or bad I'm doing, I guess, which, you know, it can be tough. But as long as you approach it from, a, you know, an overall holistic standpoint and, you know, kind of know that injuries can happen and this can happen and you can dwindle, I think, it you know, you can be all right. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's crazy, too, because it's easy to um, like. So, for example, I had an injury uh, like a year and a half ago, and I'm half the guy that I used to be physically. And it's easy to associate yourself for so long with like everyone knew me as like the bodybuilder guy, the fitness guy. And then you get injured and like you don't want to post as much content. You don't feel like you look the same and you can easily just be like, like, who am I now? Because you associated with that mm. guy so long. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that it's, it's something a lot of people deal with. So for you, when, when did it, how long ago did you transition of like, I just liked weightlifting, it, it got out of aggression, I like to see the results to, I want to compete in bodybuilding. Right. So um, we can kind of continue where I was just uh, kind of had my first membership. I went away for university studying music. So I was still doing that. But, you know, I found the weight training was still like a good outlet because I might I might practice guitar four or five hours a day. And then that was all just sitting down. And then finally, the lifting was like my outlet. And I just found myself, I still was making slow and steady progress and my interest wasn't dwindling in fact i remember being really upset because i actually hurt my back um early on deadlifting and it took me like a year to recover from that uh, it was just a really bad strain i guess i kept re repetitively doing it and uh it was really upsetting me that i couldn't train because i felt like i kind of lost my outlet there um so eventually that did heal and i did you know slowly start to come back and build some muscle as i was you know still my focus was music but the interest kind of like persisted there and then as i as I finished university, I ended up kind of getting burned out with music and just kind of, you know, I saw where people were going, all my class, all my, um, my, gra my graduating class, a lot of them were going on to grad school. And, um, I thought that was cool. And I thought about it for myself, but I just didn't see myself continuing to do it. Um, my experience was too, like, I really had to struggle hard just to get like decent grades. Um, you know, we use percentages mostly for our, our grades here, but I think I, I graduated with like a 75 average or something. And that was that took all my effort, you know, to get. And uh, that process kind of burned me out of music. Uh, well, at the same time, my interest for weight training and bodybuilding was growing. And, you know, I would I would follow other people's journeys. So at, at the time, you know, Instagram wasn't created. It was still I was still on Teen Nation. I was following some guys actually um, from the East Coast area. Um, I think one of the guys names um, is Stu Yellen. Actually, he was a. Uh, 
he won the WMBF Hercules show in maybe 2010 or something. And so I was watching that. I saw here's a guy who's been training for a while. He's about 5'9", about 170 pounds on stage. And I was like, well, that seems manageable to me, you know, um, uh, for what I was weighing. And, of course, I, I had very little knowledge about how much I'd weigh or how much muscle I had. But I was like, that seems like, you know, something I could possibly do. So after I graduated university, I was pretty dead set on doing a show. Um, I had been bulking for about, you know, four or five years straight. So I had quite a lot of body fat at that point. But I uh, kind of got into my first contest prep. I think it was in the summer of 2012 to compete in the fall of 2012. So it was about a 20 week prep. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how I just how I just get into it. And then after that, I just kept going, I guess. Yeah. So what, so going to your first show, what did you follow in regards? Was it just looking at content online? Did you hire a coach? Like, what was your experience through the first prep? Because the first one is, it, it's an eye-opening experience from all the way around, from being hungry to fatigue to not, you think, most people are like, oh, you're really lean. And you're like, no, like, there's a whole nother level of lean. Mm. So, yeah, you know, it, it's it's kind of funny looking back. Um, I did, you know, I would think, too, like, people, I, I had heard these messages. People would say, like, oh, the end of the diet's really hard. Like, you won't like how you feel. Like, you're going to be hungry. And I was like, man, I can do this. Like, I won't. Like I'll be, I'll just be dedicated. I'll follow what my coach says, and it won't, it won't be an issue. Like I, it, it won't affect me. Right. Of course, then I got, you know, like four <laughs> weeks out, like everyone else, and I was literally dying. But in in terms of what I did, I kind of made, I made a few uh, mistakes in a sense. Uh, I would say, um, I see a lot of people still do, doing things like this now. But uh, you know, the first mistake would have been I started with way too much body fat with not enough time, right? So I was, right. I think around. Uh, I started around 20 weeks out and I probably had about 40, 40, 45 pounds to lose to be in decent yeah, shape. And of course, of course, it didn't it didn't all come off. And the second thing I did that was a mistake is I actually coach hopped mid preparation. So I started with um, a really popular online coach at the time. He still coaches. His name's Derek Charlebois from Michigan. And uh, we were it was going well. Um, I was, you know, dropping the body fat, staying consistent. But I realized at some point, wow, I'm not going to get get there in time and i had kind of brought it up with him a few times saying that i think we should go a little bit faster you know and then he kind of just like oh no i like this pace and i kind of got frustrated and jumped ship and went to someone else and then the pace of it really picked up but then also the fatigue was really bad too and it kind of you know now that i've done all these shows my perspective is is such that okay actually the pace derek had me traveling at was a-okay you know it was just the just I had so much expectations for my first show and then when they weren't coming to light the way I thought they would, I thought I needed to change. So, um, yeah, uh, that was that was kind of how I went about at least the coaching. I, di I I realized, too, I didn't really know enough to prep myself at that point about nutrition and stuff. Um, and it was only till 2019 that I decided that I could coach myself. So, um, yeah, at that point, I had two different coaches during two different parts of the prep. <laughs> so your last show you did, you prepped yourself. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, I went through the same thing where I, the, I, the, the men's physique show I did when I was like 22 years old. Um, he had me go, die away too hard. I came in super flat. The tan was atrocious. I got like sunburnt like weeks before it was just a shit show. So like I had such a bad experience with the coach, even though he had like an ex phys background and I was like, Oh, he's super smart. At that point I, I did very similar to what you're doing now where it just became educating myself, following the right people I mean, my background is, is the exercise science side too. So just learning physiology, metabolic, like, like all the, the details of it on your own and then following the right content. And the last two shows I did were, were by myself. And I feel like there's tons of value in having a coach and an objective person. But um, I think at the same time, I was like, I wanted to control everything that happened. I was like, I'll ride and die on my own shoulders. I'd rather ride and die on my own shoulders than have someone else kind of screw something up. And then you yeah. learn a lot about your body after you go through a few preps of, because like the stress factors, the lack of sleep, the weight gains. Like, I mean, there's so many variables going on when it comes to your weight that it's easy to mess with yourself. But I, I, I was the same as you. I like that control. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the more experience and knowledge you have, it's actually you become a little bit harder to coach. Um, and and uh, someone might give you a suggestion. And you might think, uh, I don't know if I would do that for one of my clients. So then it kind of becomes it becomes more difficult, I think, uh, the longer you do it. But, you know, it's funny. I just recalled a, a memory right now I, when I was backstage at my first show, which went really bad. I had, you know, all these issues and we can we can go into some of those if you want. But I kind of have an issue where my ankles will swell up um, with it. I still don't really know why it happens. I've been meaning to research that a little bit more. But my ankles will like become like pregnant lady cankles and I'll hold like pounds and yeah. pounds of water. Yeah. So that and that still happens with me today if I prep really hard. But um 
and I've learned tools to fix that. But I remember basically, you know, to make a long story short, I was backstage at that first show and I hated how I looked. I hated how I came in. Uh, I didn't fix the ankle problems in time. So I had cankles. People were it was and it was a non-tested show because there wasn't any testing around, even though I was natural. I, it's just there was no drug That's tested shows. Show to walk into. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I remember, too, there was a coach backstage and I still see him around some local shows here. Uh, coaches a lot of people, a uh, great bodybuilder himself. And he he came to me and he and I think now looking back, he was just looking to pick up a new client. But he came to me and he, he said, oh, you look pretty good. He's like, he's like, I think you can improve. He's like, do you, do you know what you need to do? That's what he asked me. And when he said that, I thought a lot of different things in my head. And I, the first thing that came to my head was, well, I need to take enhancements to compete. Like I'm backstage and like he's like, you know what you need to do. And I, and I thought what he was suggesting me to do was like take gear. And I was like, yeah. And I was kind of conflicted for a while. You know, maybe I should go down that road or maybe I shouldn't. But then I decided you know, just to kind of stick with it. And then finally, the next year, there was a natural show that came to my area for the first time ever. So I decided to prep for that show. And then I, I, I told myself, like, if I feel like I do well at that show, I'll just probably stick with natural bodybuilding. And then I did prep for that show. And I came second that year. And that that was the show that made me realize I wanted to keep doing this and that I had some potential at it. Whereas before on the non-tested show, I came like, I came 14th out of 15th in the in the light heavy class, light heavyweight class, I think it was. So um, yeah, that those those were two experiences I remember that really solidified in my mind that I wanted to continue to compete naturally. Yeah, it's, it's a very similar story to me though. Is like my first show, Men's Physique, we had um, twenty one uh, twenty one guys. I came in, I think second to last or last, and then took like three years off, did bodybuilding. Um, twenty seven guys came in second overall. One my novice, one my class, and then one um, second overall, and then my final one. Yeah, 19 guys and then up winning overall and then you know my class it's funny though because it's very similar to you in that aspect what um so when it comes to that story we'll, we'll touch on that first since you brought it up so what was that story you're talking about just like the horrific mess that you know that that was with, with uh with the water retention in my ankles yeah so like for you that was obviously like like what the heck is going on like what was that what all that about yeah well it's funny um when it first happened, I thought it was almost to be expected because there's all this kind of, um, I guess, folklore about like holding water before a show and needing to drop water. And remember, this is back in 2012 before kind of the cutting water thing had been dispelled. And there's a lot of um, kind of tradition that goes into prep for a bodybuilding show. And one of them is cutting water, which I think mostly comes from like bodybuilders in the 80s using like heavily water attentive like steroids uh, right. that were they were they they probably do look better if they cut water because you know those compounds make them make the look of their body drastically more watery right whereas the natural guy shouldn't have to worry about that but I didn't really know that at that time so my anchors were kind of swelling up and I was it was brutally hard I think that prep was one of the most hardest things I've gone through to be honest the first one um because I just didn't know what to expect, I guess. Um, and I just, it started to happen. And then, you know, I just, I thought it was par for course. And I thought when we cut water, it would go away. And then, of course, the Monday came with my coach then. And he started to do this. He did this whole water drop thing where you drink more water at the first of the week and then cut it out later. But I remember drinking that first three gallons and my body just held on to it even more. It was crazy and it was getting really bad. And I almost dropped out of the show, to be honest. Um, I didn't really know what to do. And I was like, Number one, that I was in tears because I just didn't know like what I should do about it. And I was talking to the coach about it. He's like, I haven't really seen this before. I don't really know what to do about it. Right. So um, turns out that when I get it now, which I still will, when I push my body really hard, I just need to kind of rest, eat a little bit more. And once the stress kind of dies down of being in that huge color of deficit, for whatever reason, it'll wash away. It might take three or four days, but it'll go away. Um, so, so I ended up getting on stage with the cankles and I had people backstage asking me like what diuretic I took and like, like, did I mess up my like sodium or whatever, or did you drink a bunch of water? Like, what did you do to fuck to F yourself up, you know, this badly. Right. So, um, that was actually, uh, like it ended up being horrific, but what it ended up doing was making me so upset with the result. I was like, I need to redeem myself because like, I know this is something I want to do. So now I'm going to like put in the work and like figure out what, you know, how to fix this. Right. So. Yeah, that was that's kind of how it works with me. And it still happens. It happened in my 2019 prep, too. And it was the same thing. I was I had a few days of worry about it not going away. Um, and I almost dropped out of the show again because I was like, damn, this is happening again. And I knew in my mind um, if I just rested and didn't go to the gym, it would go away. But it it was trying uh, in the sense that it took like three or four days for it to drop. So 
I remember at, at the highest point, the most water retention, I was weighing 179 after my third day off, eating a little bit more food, resting, no gym. And it was, it was difficult, too, because I was going through a funeral for my grandfather at the time, too. So it was very emotionally stressful. All this was adding up. But at the peak of my highest weigh, and I was like 179. And then uh, I believe after, there was one night where it all kind of washed away after I took three days off. And then I, the next morning, I was like 173. So I lost like six pounds overnight of just that fluid retention. And then I was peeled out of my mind. And right. then I went, I, I went from uh, thinking that I wasn't going to make the show to now I'm going to win the show because I saw my condition. But um, yeah, that was very, very mentally difficult hurdle to get through for a lot of the preps that I've done. Thankfully, like I said, I've learned how to troubleshoot it, but you, it, there's always that worry. Like, is it going to fix, fix itself or is it just going to come back, you know, before I can fix it? So, yeah. It's crazy though. There's so many people that have a misconception of just like how much stress is on the body, whether it's physical stress, whether it's mental stress, whether it's relationship stress, whether it's body stress. And it's like, it just fucks your body up, man. Like so bad. And like you, everyone's like, go, go, go die harder. And then they're cutting more calories and doing more cardio. And I'm like, bro, like you said, take like three days to breathe and your weight's going to come off. Like you have to, it contradicts logic, but it's like your body's going through so much. It's yeah. wild. And so I think this thing is interesting. There's a lot of information now about it being like people will just, you know, blanket say to call it cortisol, which it may or may not be. I don't think there's any really proof behind that uh, from what I've researched. But, you know, it does seem to be if you take yourself out of the deficit for a while and just let your body de-stress, there will be like a flushing effect. And what is it? Is it is it water retention? Is it something else? I just people don't really know. But right. for me, it's it's very prevalent. Um, and. I haven't seen many other documented cases like myself. I know uh, Eric Helms has talked about it happening to himself too. And the thing is, yeah. you're never really going to see pe see people document this because when it happens, when you're prepping for a show and you see your physique just change for the worse, all of a sudden it is devastating. You don't want to take a picture. You don't want to talk about it. Um, you know, you don't want to, like I said, document it. So it might, it might have, it may happen to more people than they actually, you know, talk about, but. You know, there's not a lot of literature out there that really helped me navigate that. It was more of an experience thing that, you know, was able to get me through that. Well, to your literature point, too, it's 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 interesting because there's not no no like it's funny that I feel like you look at the Eric Helms, all those guys, because 3D MJ you, or, you know, I, I met Lane Norton and as a person, I, I thought he was a little eh, but like educational wise, one of the smartest humans I've ever talked to or met. And I love all his content. Um, but it's just crazy because you look at these like bodybuilders and athletes that have like PhDs in nutrition and stuff that like talk about this. And then you have, you know, I went to school, you have these other PhD teachers and it's like, it's not even compatible, the difference of knowledge, because it's just like the application compared to just the research. And it, it's, it just blows my mind because it's like, I have people that are like, well, I'm a doctor. I'm like, yeah, I'm not a doctor. And like, all your stuff doesn't make any sense, you know, because it just doesn't, um, I want to ask you this. Are you a, uh, if it fits your macros guy? Yeah, more or less I am. Um, so I would have made that transition around 20, 2013. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I remember it was a difficult transition at first because there's a lot of uncertainties about it. But um, yeah, I definitely, that's how I prep myself now. And I am, I'm kind of like in between. I'm, I'm, I'm very pro nutritional knowledge. So the more you know, the more you're armed with good choices you can make for yourself. But um and it, it all like that's not to say you can't fit some fun stuff into your calories here and there. But for me, I will I will go for foods that I think are going to just make my prep better. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the most. But, you know, with, with that being said, I have a, lots of varieties, like different fruits, vegetables with nothing really being off the table and keeping an open mind to like what can work and what and what might be a bad idea to put in. Right. Yeah. So I'm in the same boat. Uh, I just think for. I like my. I think for the average person, it's difficult sometimes to educate them on that. And then once you do, it's a good spot to be. But when you're specifically in bodybuilding, I mean, I always did it because I'm the same way. I'm whole foods, nutrient dense foods. Try to get that. They're whole, you know, they more fiber keeps you fuller. And and your lack of nutrients that you're getting in a prep as you get a deficit, like you need to be taking those in. So, but like you said, if you're craving something to fit it in, I've been always been that that same way. And and then my fiance, she had an eating disorder, and for her, like allowing her to like be able to put things in and it's okay and not to stress has been helpful for her too. Um, so that, that's been my experience. I, I'm a huge advocate of it because I just think it gives you more sustainability and balance, you know? 
Yeah, and I, I think everyone's approach to nutrition and how they're going to psychologically experience food is going to be vastly different. So I think some people will definitely excel being on more of a regimented meal plan. And then some people can't do that. They need more variety. And, you know, um, I remember sitting back in a psychology class and the 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 professor saying that, you know, we we as a species, you know, require a variety of different foods. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that is definitely an advantage to have being able to be flexible. And then sometimes you have to travel as well, too. And you can't really prep all your food the way you want to. So you have to kind of deal with what's available. So that's also another advantage to being flexible. Yeah. It's just it, it's a matter of being responsible with it and making responsible choices, I think. Um, and I think there was some alert to me at first with um, diving that way because I thought it would be uh, easier, I guess, in a sense. But then I found out it's really not that much easier. You still need to be on top of it. You still need to plan things. Uh, you can't get all your food in like one meal a day and think that's going to be as good as spacing your protein out or as, you know, um, or if just, you know, like, like I thought it would take the whole planning component out of it, which is what I was struggling with. Right. But it doesn't, you know, you need to just always be on top of that, no matter if you're on a meal plan or a flexible dieter. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it's cool, too, because like to, to that point is when you're doing like a, if it fits your macros type style lifestyle, I think people have to realize, too, is if your goal is like weight loss, like when calories equate, like it's equal. But like the response from like you know, having every, like a source of protein, protein synthesis, like, and like getting like the, the reactions as you want, like what is optimal compared to what is reality. And I think that's where there's a misconception too, a lot of the time. Um, so I wanted to talk, you brought it up in your last thing. Cause I think this is where most bodybuilders completely screw up everything. They overthink the process and whether it's a coach that maybe has just, this is what he's known or isn't really educated on that. In, in the peak week. So with peak week, I think 99% of bodybuilders have no clue what they're walking into and they overthink the whole process. To me, it's very simple. If you look sick a week out, do not screw anything up and just do what you've been doing for that week. I mean, there's a little bit of more sodium on those days and there's a little bit more timing to make sure you're full. But um, I don't know how you attack peak week, but I always did a like front load. I pretend like the Monday was like what I wanted to look like and then I taper it and then try to time it right for that that saturday but what, what's your input or uh, take on peak week well i've done it a few different ways and um this is this is actually probably another good story to bring up too when i did um the monster mash in boston in 2016 i actually spilled over horribly for that show and um this is when i left this is when i kind of i wouldn't say stop trusting coaches but it was kind of an experience i had where i just was like it it drove me towards self-coaching um but and it was it was also a very big learning experience uh, for everything that happened. So um, every mo or most most I guess you could say peak weeks I've done they've been like a front load like you said. Um, however, in 2016 I had a, I had the problem of taking in just too much carbohydrates and too much fat um, more than my body could absorb. And then there's kind of like a film all over your entire body. So it's not like the water retention in the ankles where it's just down there. It's more like a whole body softness, like the nutrients aren't where they're supposed to be. Or they're, I guess you could conceptualize it by saying they're in like an extracellular space, whether that's true or not. I don't really know enough about biology to say, but you have this kind of soft, waterly look. So I ended up taking up taking in too many carbohydrates, you know, uh, for that show. And that was a big disappointment because I had spent a lot of money, a nine month prep, you know do it tr trying to you know win my pro card in 2016 too um and that kind of that approach failed and i realized damn like you can fuck up peak week you know that's i did it i've done it um right. and so i my approach to carving up became more conservative too and it's funny i look back at the pictures and you could see the signs were there friday night before the show i was starting to get that film a little bit and, and it was okay it would probably have died it, it you know i took pictures saturday morning and it had died down but then the coach at who I was working with at the time had me eating quite a bit of food during the day of the show. It was too much, too much for my body. And, you know, I've kind of learned too, there is a bit of an art to peaking because there's so many compromises you make to your body to get in contest shape. And one person might not have to make as many compromises as another. And so you might be more carbohydrate sensitive, um, you know, during one week, and then you could reverse diet a little bit. And then your carbohydrate requirements for another show might be greater because now you've kind of taken yourself out of this really vulnerable state where you're extremely insulin sensitive to the point where you're like eat an apple and like blow up. Right. So to sum it up, though, my approach has been, I would say, a conservative approach. Um, I try and take in a little less carbohydrates than I think I will need 
because I account for some things that other people might not account for, like stress eating, number one. Backstage, you might just be nervously eating. I see a lot of people do that. You know, there's, if you've ever been backstage at a bodybuilding show, there's an incredible amount of food back there. And a lot of people are like, oh, you got to eat this to fill out. But, you know, do you really, you know, if you really carved up before, you really probably don't need much backstage or before stage. You just need to go on there and look tight and be separated. You know what I mean? So um, in in twenty in 2019, when I did all my peaks myself, I did three separate shows. Um, the, the first two I did with a, mon- with a, a carb load starting Wednesday, tapering down Thursday, and then taping it down even more Friday. So it might be something like Wednesday, 500 carbs, Thursday, 400 carbs, Friday, 300 carbs, Saturday should be full by then. Don't need to eat much. Just kind of keep 50 grams of carbs for a meal, a little bit of fat, um, a little bit of shot of sodium before you go on stage. Um, I did try, though, at the end of my season doing one one day carb up on Friday with a, with just 600, 700 grams carbs. And that seemed to work about as well as the other approach. Um, but that was kind of at a necessity because it, the shows were two weeks or sorry, were one week apart. So I had to kind of deplete, deplete from the load from the New York show and then kind of didn't have a chance to carb up until Friday because I needed to get I needed to get back into like that depleted state where you could take carbs. Right. Um, so, yeah, I've done it a few different ways, but I've never been um, too um, too too interested in trying the rapid approach like a Cliff Wilson where they take oh, in a yeah. lot of carbs. It's just all up. it's always kind of scared me to be honest. Um, and just since I had that experience where I spilled over, I'm a little bit gun shy for it. And I will say too, if you look at Cliff's guys, a lot of them do come in really full and they look great. But I've seen some cases where I thought that they might have looked better just a little bit less carb carbed up. If you look at Doug Miller in his um. In his, I think it was 2017 prep. He is massive. He is full, but I think he could look, could have looked a little bit more separated had he not carved up as heavily. Um, you know, he's just, a freak, just though. He's I know, a freak. Like you can't, no one can touch him. There's no one that can touch him. I mean, I know. So, and you could say maybe he was playing to his strengths by being fully carved up. Like no right. one's going to touch him in size. Now he's going to be even more enormous. That extra one percent, and it's not going to matter. And you know, I, I I could see that. But if you if you look at him, his arms are so pumped up. You can't even like see the fine details in them. And you know, if you over pump a muscle, it's going to look a little bit blurry. That's why no one pumps up their quads before stage, right? Because they want to see the separation. It's the same thing too with other muscle groups. Just a matter of some of them are affected more than others. Yeah. No, I, I mean, the freakiest dude I've ever seen. I met Doug at the Arnold Expo. And I'm like, I thought I was like, I felt I was like off season. I was like 195. I'm feeling good. And I walked next to Doug and I'm like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> like, it's just crazy. Um, so I want to talk about this because I think um, uh, I think this is a cool story um, and just your experience through it. And this kind of leads up to everything we talked about. Tell me about the day you won your pro card, like that experience, the mindset, like going into the show. How did you feel? And then like the moment when you won, just like, you know, it's just you've been working so long and hard for this. Just that whole experience that day. Yeah. So um, it, it was it was crazy. Um, you know, I, I remember. Like I said, I had nerves about even just going and I was I had my doubts um, even a few weeks before because um, I there's no W member shows where I live. So I was going to spend a lot of money flying there. Um, I was going to spend a lot of money on the hotels, the travel, the tan, everything. It adds up. And I had my doubts. Right. Um, but yeah, the morning I remember the morning I woke up and, you know, I was definitely nervous uh, for sure. And uh, you, you can you can see it too in in my posing routine. I have a clip of uh, Mike Pusinella who did all the Kai doc Kai Green documentaries. I did this a few weeks out. Talked to him. I wanted him to give a little bit of a voiceover on my routine that said I was you know competing for the pro card. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what I, you just I, posted today, right? A- absolutely. So go yeah. go check it out. It's the last post on my page. If anyone wants to see it, so you know, it, I just remember walking on stage and I was like, man, to have like a little clip like that, I better bring it like it better look good or else this people are going to be like what is this guy thinking like you know what i mean but you know i remember i was it was it's and it, it was the most popular song of the year right ariana grande seven rings and i remember i was backstage at my warm-up show like 10 10 weeks before and they were playing that song and it said you know i want it i got it i want it i got it right and i was like I, like i want the pro card like if i tell myself i've got it i can win it so i was just thinking like that's the perfect song to use right so i got him to voice that over and I think that that helped me quite a bit because it showed the judges this guy really wants to win, right? And uh, obviously the physique has to be considered too. But um, I'm telling you, even backstage at the show, I didn't think I was actually going to win because I remember 
I, I came in, people were pumping up, and I saw this big uh, black gentleman, uh, probably an inch or two higher, taller than me. I'm, I'm 5'11", so he would have been maybe six feet, maybe I'd say, 6'1". And he was massive. And I, at first I was like, oh, yeah, he's just a pro because they hold the pro universe the same day. I was like, he's just a WMBF pro, probably going to like do really well in the pro class. And then I found out, no, he's the only heavyweight in this show. I'm going to have to go up against him. And I was like, damn, I almost thought I was going to, you know, I, di I didn't, I'm not going to get it then. And I was like, I was starting to get disappointed because like I just saw him. And uh, then I had a little bit of a confidence boost because I took, I was like checking my tan. I took off my stuff. I hit a most muscular in the, in like the, okay. All right. So I was, I was backstage there and I got a confidence boost because I took off my, like uh, my cover ups and I hit a most muscular in the mirror and the whole room looked at me. Right. It was like, it was like good lighting, whatever. Like, like you could, you could see all the cuts and I was like, okay, maybe I might have something, but then, you know, I'm, it, and it was kind of like this. It was like, I felt good for a second. Then I, I don't know. And I'm unsure of myself. Right. It was kind of a wavering of emotions. And I got in for my class. I'm talking to the guys in my class and, one of the guys who I'm competing against, he's he's talking to me and he's like, he's he's kind of got like this sleeveless shirt, massive arms, massive back, massive chest, just like the show muscles like popping out. And he's like, yeah, like I used to be a WMBF pro, you know, back in the day, but they want me to like requalify so I can do worlds. And I was like, damn, I was like, this guy's like won all these shows. Like I'm gonna have to go up against him. I'm gonna have to, you know, like I might not be able to beat him or whatever. Right. So we did prejudging or whatever. I was in the center, so I felt really good. I talked to my friends. Actually, Chris Barricat was there, and my friend um, Albert Chow was there. And I was like, "Do I have the class?" And they're like, "I think so." Like some of the some of the guys' shots were a little bit better from the back, but you're better from the front, from the side, all that stuff. And then, um, so it ends up, you know, the awards. I win my class. I'm pumped. And at that point, I didn't. I actually didn't care about winning. I was just happy I was there. And we're doing the overall post down uh, next to that guy I just mentioned because he was the only guy in the heavyweight class. So we're up there and they're comparing us. And I remember this moment perfectly. They were playing. Um, what what was the song? Uh, Mercy, Mercy Me. That was it. Go. All right. So it's actually good now because I remember I remember the, the name of the artist. It was they were playing like funk during the post down. So we're posing down and they're playing M Mercy Me by Marvin Gaye. And uh, check out that song. It's like really chill, really relaxed kind of funk tune from maybe the 70s or something. But it didn't even matter. I didn't care. Like I, in my mind, I wasn't going to win. I was just happy I was there with my class and was being compared for the pro cards. So um, I was just um, wasn't expecting a lot. I really thought the guy next to me had it. Um, but then we, we finished the pose down. And during the pose down, they were saying, you know, you guys are making us work because we don't, you know, it's a tough call. And I... I I, that didn't really register in my mind, but I was just like, hmm, okay. So they they announced the overall winner. It's my name, and I couldn't believe it. Like I I still to this day have trouble trouble um you know just just thinking how I how I won because I just I really thought this guy had it you know next to me. And if you look at the pictures, it was really close. I just edged him out a little bit in conditioning, kind of like what what we talked about earlier with with you. And there was maybe a few muscle groups where I had a little bit extra you know, here and there on them, but, you know, um, it was really close and they ended up calling me and I'll be, be forever thankful for that moment. But yeah, it was, it was insane. And then I remember just afterwards, um, it was me and my brother traveled with me. Actually, he traveled from a different part of Canada. We met up in Montreal and then flew to New York and we were just, just, you know, touring New York with that big trophy feeling on top of the world. And we, I'm, I'm going to be honest, whenever I'm having a bad day, I remember that that moment. I remember that song, and everything just clicks, and I feel I'm a, in a good mood again. So, no, yeah, that's awesome. that's awesome, man. I mean, I, I can completely relate to that. It's just uh, you're like I I remember because there was a moving parts where like I moved to Boston. I was biking to work. I was, you know, had a backpack, picking up groceries. I was living in this little shack and trying to make get survive out there. And uh, I remember days of like biking home, and I'd be like. I, I was the most mentally locked I'd ever been in my life between work and that and just making it happen. And it was crazy because I was I remember uh, biking home one day in the rain. And I'm like, just like yelling in the rain. I'm like, let's fucking go. Like just hyped. And um, my, my moment on the stage is like, I, I, I remember when I won the overall, I was, I was in the back and um, I was with my girlfriend at the time. And I was like getting ready to go back. Like they're getting ready to call the winners. And I'm, I'm like, man, it was an emotional moment. I remember sitting there. I'm like, I did everything i could i'm like there's no way anyone worked harder than me like there's no way i just truly believed it i'm like if i win this will be crazy and then the same the, the third second and they won it i just like broke down on stage i was like in the picture of me like my hands up i'm like tearing up 
And like, I remember picturing me on the stage. I'm like, with my trophy, like one knee down. I'm like, holy shit, I made it. But it's such, such a, it's, it's like until someone wins like that and like, and goes through like the, the 20 weeks of preps, the years of competing, the, all that stuff, there's like, it's just the, the final buildup of like, holy shit, like we did it, you know, like it's just such a good feeling. Did you think you were going to win? Did you, did you have an idea or were you um, nervous about well, it? Well, like, so like in uh, open, I, I'll be, so I had a buddy of mine, Kabira, who competed. Um, I was good friends with him. We had a falling out and he, I actually had the video he posted online of the old comparison rounds and he actually deleted it. I'm not trying to call him out, but he deleted it after our friendship fell apart. So I don't have a memory of like the, the comparison, but I remember um, my family came too. That was what was cool. So I'm, everyone's watching and, uh, I'm in the overall, and I remember I started on the outside, and then they, like, did comparisons, they put us all back, and then they called out, like, top five, and at first, they didn't call me out, I'm like, are you freaking kidding me, like, no way, and then they're, like, they called me out, I'm like, okay, so I'm like, all right, now I gotta work, so I started on the outside, and then slowly but surely got to the middle, and then I'm like, I think I was in the middle, and they're like, you were between you and one other guy, because it was a no, I think it was six, it was an odd number, so I really wasn't positive, and then after I won the overall, I was like, okay, like, there's nothing to lose at this point. I'm going to act like I own the stage. And when they had the pose down between the three of us, I was like, I knew I was better than one, but the kid that I thought was going to had a shot at beating me, I'm like, I'm leaner, but he has way better shape. So then it was just like, music came on and you're like, this is my fucking stage, baby. Like, take it from me. And then it, you know, I, I didn't know, to your point, at the end, when I was in the back, I'm like with my girlfriend, I'm just like, I, I don't know. If, if I, it would have broke me if I didn't win because I felt like I gave everything. And, um, I was on the fence. It was a 50-50 shot if I was first or second. But it was amazing. I mean, by far one of the most rewarding days of my life, for sure. I think it's it's one thing to prep like you're going to win the show, be in the gym, and see your physique be, like, a lot better than, you know, everyone else probably around you. But then when you get to the show, the psychology is a lot different, and it becomes a lot more intimidating when you see everyone backstage. Yeah. And I remember... Armor two, we're we're backstage and they're having the competitors meeting, and I'm just you're just kind of size never went up. Like one guy has like a sleeve of shirt, massive arms, but then you know ends up you know not being like that conditioned, right? And you're just, but it's it's hard to tell when you're backstage, and it's hard to have the confidence to be like that you're that you're gonna like beat all these people, right? So yeah, yeah, it's I was the last person to take my shirt off, and I remember I was hesitant because I I was small, like I was just way smaller than a lot of the guys, and then. The moment that I built some confidence in the back was you're getting ready to like pump up. And I finally took my shirt off and I wasn't jacked or anything, but I had a decent chest. I had different parts that were strong on me. And I remember taking it off and I just like tightened my hands up, just like flex. And then the kid next to me who was competing, I actually knew he's like, damn, dude. He's like, you look fucking sick. I'm like, all right, I feel pretty good now. I needed like a one little boost. Um, but yeah, it, it's crazy, man. It, it's a wild experience for sure. Um, so I want to ask you one other question before we kind of sum this thing up. So in my eyes, I like to end this with kind of a question that people can, you know, find useful or they can connect with or things along that line. So I think with bodybuilding, there's a lot of ups and downs over your bodybuilding career. What was kind of like the lowest point where you maybe, you know, struggled where you were going to stop competing or you didn't know if you're going to be able to continue and then how did you mentally get out of that? What, you know, what were the, what, what was that moment? And like, how did you get past that and move forward to end up winning your pro card? It was definitely the feeling after the 2016 monster mash when I spilled over. Um, and it was, it was tough mentally because I was backstage and I knew what my condition was and I saw the people in my class and it was a tough class. You know, I'm not taking away anything, anything from the guys, but um, I remember being funding the winner on social media after, and I was just like, I don't like, I know this guy is good, but I just don't see what he has on me, you know, as a complete physique. And I, it was really frustrating to see myself like come all that way and spend all that money just to have it be messed up for like the, the day of the show with the, with the spilling over and not being as sharp. Um, and it, that was a show where I kind of had the same mindset as 2019 where I really wanted to win. But, you know, I just kind of had to take a deep breath and be like, you just got to go back to the drawing board and you just need to be better. Like, you know what I mean? Cause I had taken a, a two and a half year off season from my last show in 2013 and I had made all these improvements. So that was great to see. Um, but it was a little bit crushing to just, you know, it, it's funny people do a bodybuilding show and a lot of people, they see the trophies and they see the glory and whatever, but 
if you do a show where you place like fourth or fifth, I, I think I was th- I was third that year in my class. But if you do a show where you don't place where you want to be, you just feel like a number. You know what I mean? You get up on stage. They don't really look at you like you may get, you know, likes and comments in your pictures. Say people you look great. But when you're at this and you're at the show, you don't get that call. You feel like nothing. You feel like nothing. You did matter. You feel like, you know, um, so that's kind of what I felt like at the time. And it was, you know, it was hard um, for sure. And but I just had to. I just knew I'd be back someday. Um, I had the goal too in my mind. I had made this when I made this goal in 2013 that I was going to win a WMBF Pro Card before I was 30. So um, basically, what happened is I think at that time I would have been just it, actually the Monster Mash was uh, was on my birthday. It was on my 27th birthday, which made it all the more. I had it built up. It was going to be the best day of my life, and then it was was not because it was my like I said, it was my birthday. I thought I was going to win my Pro Card. I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Um, but it didn't work out that way, right? So then I, it just took me that long to kind of have a nice production box off season, and then have the the time and the right circumstance to get back there in 2019 to go for it again. So um, yeah, I mean that was definitely the lowest point. But I I kept that in mind the whole prep too. I remembered, you know, like I was doing cardio at the end, and I was just visualizing myself on stage, and I was remembering, you know, I spent all this money and time last time and I didn't make it and it all blew up in five minutes. I'm not letting that happen again. Right. So, uh, that frustration, even, it, even though it was three years, um, three years removed from it for the 2019 prep, it still stuck with me and it still kind of drove me to just be better and to like constantly check myself to make sure that I wasn't going to make that same mistake. So yeah, that was definitely, yeah, yeah. that's definitely the lowest to highest right there. <laughs> that's great. And I guess I thought of one little last thing is, what advice would you give someone to uh, help get out of the point that they do hit that low, whether it's the bodybuilding, whether it's their work, whether it's life, like what strategy did you, are you person that listens to like audiobooks? Are you like, what are you doing to keep yourself positive, motivated and continue to moving forward? Or is that something that's just built in you? Um, well, I'd say with bodybuilding, it was such, uh, I had such a drive to do it. I didn't really need to self motivate myself that much, but I mean, if you're someone who's kind of at that point, you gotta, I think you gotta look at a few things. You gotta see like, okay, the goals that you made for yourself now that you've tried them maybe and they, it didn't wasn't quite there, like are the goals realistic? So step back and look at everything. So like for me, like winning an, uh, a, a non-tested show like in 2012 when I, was, when I was natural, that was not a realistic goal, right? So I had to kind of um, shift my goal to like winning a show like that to winning, you know, like a natural show, right? Which is just realistic and makes sense, right? So I think you need to check yourself there. And then just just you need to check that you're actually enjoying what you're doing, because if you're not enjoying what you're doing, it's probably not you're always kind of going to be fighting yourself. So you got to take a really good, hard look at what your goals are and just make sure that this is the right goal for you. And uh, I'm sure you're the same. You've worked with lots of clients over the years that wanted to, to compete or whatever. But then they found out what kind of went into it and then they were they kind of realized it wasn't for them. So just just make sure that, you know, you really want to do what you want to do, I guess. And then. Hopefully the cards fall in place. Give it your all. And if they don't, at least you gave it all your all, you know, and if you want to move on, that's fine. It was the same thing with music. I wanted to be a professional musician. I wanted to play at an extremely high level. I did kind of. And but then once I realized um, when I got to this certain point, I wasn't really keen on putting the time level in to get to the next level. I kind of gotten what I wanted about it. And there's nothing wrong with moving on to a new a new thing if you feel like you've done what you wanted with it. And, you know, you have other interests you want to pursue. So. Yeah, I'd say that would be my take on that. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, taking the time to tell your story, and uh, hopefully people will be inspired, whether they're in bodybuilding and they're trying to, to just achieve a goal and get a pro card or simply just try to overcome some obstacles in their life and just, you know, hopefully they'll connect with your story and, and go from there, man. But I appreciate you coming on. Absolutely, man. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, if someone wants to reach you, what's the best way? Is it Instagram? Yeah, check out my Instagram. It's uh, Connor dot Saint Jean uh, um, or at Connor dot Saint Jean. Uh, you'll find me there. Uh, p- profile is open. Send me a message if you want, and we can uh, chat about whatever your goals are or whatever you you want to hear from me. So yeah, hit me up. All right, man. Cool. All right, everyone. I'll see you guys till next time. Awesome. Thanks so much.